I look forward to getting up here and preaching. Uh, in Alaska, where I came from, we have sled dogs. And if anybody's from Alaska, when they hook those sled dogs up, they have to have a snow anchor and a rope around a tree because they're straining at the harness and jumping and, and, and barking and whining, and they're ready to go. And if you watched me over here, I'm full of nervous energy because when it's my time to preach, just get everything out of the way, I'm ready to go. So if you could throw the slide up on the screen, um, obviously I'm, I'm the security guy and I want you to meet my team. I was actually gonna take pictures of the guys, but I didn't have time. So if you can't read the caption there, it says we're pretty sure you have the wrong house, but hey, come on in, let's talk about it. In, in, in my former life, I was from Alaska for 29 years. I was a, a police officer there, there for 23 years. And, and law enforcement is totally different in Alaska than it is here. Police officers there have statewide jurisdiction. They can go anywhere they want to. Um, I worked for the city of North Pole. That's not the geographical North Pole. It's a, it's a tourist community 15 miles south of Fairbanks on the Alaska Highway. Yes, there's a 40-foot tall Santa Claus on the highway. There are reindeer out behind. There's actually a guy that works at the Santa Claus store, the house there, that legally changed his name to Chris Kringle so he could play Santa Claus. Uh, but but we, had, we didn't have counties there, we had boroughs. Our borough was bigger than the state of Rhode Island. And you watch cops on TV or live PD and you got 12 or 15 cops show up on, showing up on a call. We were lucky if in all the agencies we had in our, in our borough, if we had 15 cops working at one time. So if you had five guys show up, you were really lucky. And one night I went 50 miles for a domestic. So that's how far things are spread out there and how long it takes you to get there. Backup is non-existent a lot of times, so you learn to talk your way out of things. I literally talked myself out of getting hit one night. I knew he was going to hit me. He was bigger than me. I knew it was going to hurt when he did it, and I literally talked myself, talked him out of it. Don't ask me how, but it worked, and we learned to do that. We, uh, we had a couple sayings at North Pole Police. One was, this ain't the movies and you ain't John Wayne. And, and, and what we meant by that was, you watch TV, John Wayne never gets shot, he never gets hurt, he never runs out of bullets, galloping on a horse, he can take one shot at 150 yards, knock a guy off a horse, he always comes out the good guy, but what we meant by that was, I don't care how big and bad you are, how big of a badge you got on your chest, or how big a gun you got on your hip, you ain't John Wayne, you can die, so be careful. The other saying we had, and this is true of every police department I've ever had association with, is law enforcement is 98% boredom and 2% sheer terror. Now when you watch live PD or cops on, P on, on TV, they show the 2% sheer terror because if they showed the 98% boredom, nobody would watch it. And I've seen my share of the 2% sheer terror. I can tell you from firsthand experience that the business end of a 12-gauge shotgun with a drunk guy in the trigger end looks like you could walk down the barrel like that and never touch either side. I know what it's like to jump off an apartment balcony about that tall to avoid that shotgun. I know what it's like to hunker down behind a wood pile in a guy's front yard and hope it stops the 44 slugs coming at you from the other direction. I know what it's like to lay down in the front seat of a police car and drive it between a drunk guy with a rifle and two troopers that are pinned down by his bullets and hope that the car door is going to stop the bullets. I know what it's like to stand on the Richardson Highway beside a crumpled mass of steel that used to be a car and listen to the gasping, dying breaths of a young lady pinned inside and dying of a broken neck, and you know that there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. I know what it's like to listen to the agonized screams of a young mother who came home and found her 14-year-old son who had just blown his brains out with a 44 mag pistol. I know what it's like to kneel down in front of a little seven-year-old girl and look into her tear-filled brown eyes as she asks me, will you take the bullets out of my mommy, who lay dead on the living room floor about 10 feet from her, gunned down by her dad. Those are the moments of sheer terror that wake you up at night, that keep you awake, that wake you up in a cold sweat that you can't ever get out of your mind. And those are things that I can never get away from. But I also know what the boredom is like. Did you know that if you drive into a subdivision at 3 o'clock in the morning and you look at your watch and you wonder, why in the world am I the only one awake? And if you get out of your car and bark like a dog, and you do that long enough, you get all the dogs in the neighborhood barking. And then you drive away, and about 10 minutes later, your dispatcher calls you on the radio, and she asks you to drive through this subdivision because all the people are awake and they're hearing dogs bark and they think there's a burglar. <laughs> I wouldn't know how that happens from firsthand experience. I've just heard about it. We used to play a lot of tricks on each other, and we, we, had, a, we had a blast. We had a, North Pole was a military community. 
We had our, the, the, the Air Force base on one side of us, the Army base on the other side of us, and, and please don't be offended, you guys from the military, but there is a world of difference between Army guys and Air Force guys. Air Force guys was, if you had to jack up an Air Force guy, it was, yes, sir, how, do you want me, how high do you want me to jump, sir, and where do you want me to hit when I land? Army guys was, I don't care, do what you want to do. So we dealt a lot with that, and we had a reserve division in our department, and they, they looked just like me. They wore the same uniform as me. They had the same authority as me. The only difference is I got paid, and they didn't. And we had a captain in the Army that would come in, and when it was his time to work, he would pull a shift with me. We got along really great. We made a good team. He would never check out a car and go by himself. He'd just crawl in and ride with me, and I loved going to loud parties with him. We'd have military parties. They'd get cranked up on the weekend, and they'd get drunk, and they'd start making a bunch of racket. And I didn't care if they were drunk. That wasn't my concern. My concern was they're keeping their neighbors awake. So we'd get the call. I'd go knock on the door and say, hi, I'm the police, and you're not. You're making noise, and I'm not. You need to get quieted down. And if it was a military party, if it was an army party especially, they'd be giving us a ration, and I'd be talking to them and trying to get them quieted down, and pretty soon I'd get a nudge, and, and Paul Tappan was his name. He would step forward and say, excuse me, Scotty. And I knew what was coming because he'd done it before. As only a captain in the Army could do, he would step forward and go, go, attention! And I don't care how drunk you were, you stood up. <laughs> and I loved it because he would say, who's in charge of this party? Step forward right now. And pretty soon someone would weavingly step forward in front of him and he always carried his military ID in his breast pocket of his uniform shirt and he would pull it out and say, read that out loud for the group. And they would read Captain Paul Tappan, United States Army, Fort Wainwright Army Base, Fort Wainwright, Alaska. And about the time they got to line three, they realized that they had stepped in way over their head and they probably weren't getting out. And he would explain to them in language that I won't use here because I don't talk that way anymore, how you're responsible for this party, you're responsible for the racket, you're responsible for why we're here, and you will get it quieted down, or you will go to jail, do you understand me? And there wasn't any, I don't care, it was yes, sir. So we're not coming back tonight, correct? No, sir. And so you won't see me anymore tonight, correct? Yes, sir, we won't see you anymore tonight. But you will see me in the morning at 0800 when you're standing in front of my desk to answer why we're here now. And we rarely ever had to go back when Paul was with me. We had a bar in town, and our bar was run by a, 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 a retired ex-professional football player, big guy. More than one time, I watched him drag somebody out of his bar and invite him not to come back. And they sent me over to the bar one night for an underage guy in the bar. You have to be 21 in Alaska to be in a bar. You have to be 21 to drink. Group of Army guys sitting around drinking. He's sitting there with them. And I explained to him, you're under 21. You're, you're 20 years old. You're under 21. You can't be here. You have to leave. And he says, I'm the designated driver. I'm here to take these guys home when they get done partying. And I said, great. I love that. Because if you take them home, I don't have to deal with them when they get stupid on the highway later on. But you can't be here. And I said, don't get me wrong. I don't necessarily agree with the law. You can go to the sandbox tomorrow and die for your country, but you can't drink a beer. I don't necessarily agree with that. But I'm not here to agree with it, I'm here to enforce it. The law says you can't be here, you have to go. So one of his buddies comes over and he's going to help him. And he is flat plowed under the table drunk. And I looked at him and said, now we got another problem because this is a bar. And you come into the bar and you drink beer. And when you drink beer, you get drunk. And when you reach a certain level of intoxication, you can't be here anymore and you are way past that, so you got to go too. Well, he wants to argue with me. So I finally looked at him. I said, look, you've got two choices. You can go with him and go home, or you can go to me, with me and go to jail. Which would you like to do? And here's what he did. He literally, he looked at me, he went, uh. And he just stood there with his tongue hanging out. And I did what you guys are doing. I laughed. I laughed right out loud. I said, you are so drunk, you can't figure it out. And his sergeant walked over and says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, you can. Please explain to him what I'm trying to tell him. And he explained to him, again in language I won't use, how he's going to go with his buddy and go home and not go with me. I didn't want to take the guy to jail. It's a drunk on license premise charge. It's a 35-mile round trip to the jail. He'll be home and in bed before I get done doing the paperwork. I didn't want to take him to jail. I was trying to give him an out. 
and he couldn't see it. He was so blinded and darkened by the booze that he couldn't see the answer to his problems. And that is exactly the situation that John the Baptist stepped into in the first chapter of John when he began his ministry. 400 years of total darkness. No word from God for 400 years. We get upset when we don't hear from God for a day. They hadn't heard from him in 400 years. Were there people that loved God? Yeah, there were. Were there people that were serving God? Yeah, John, John the Baptist's parents. But for the most part, there was no great spiritual outpouring, no great evangelical awakening. It was dark, and the people couldn't see until John the Baptist came on the scene. And his message was to point out Jesus. He said, I'm come. I'm not the light. I'm come to bear witness of the light. Get this, folks. That's our job. That is our job. I don't care if you're a preacher, a missionary, a teacher, a janitor. I don't care what you are. Your job is to do what John the Baptist did and point to Jesus. That's our answer, and that's our job. I love how it says a little bit further, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's who John's pointing to. God became flesh. I wrote in the margin of my Bible, God became a man and moved into our neighborhood. That's what he did. Because we couldn't move up to where he was, he moved down to where we are so he could get a hold of us. And John delighted. His sole purpose, his sole job was to point out Jesus to those around him. And that's our job. Later on in this chapter, John is walking along and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I love that verse. I love how you can read the Bible and you can read it over and over and over again and all of a sudden God just hits you upside the head with something new. And it's not a new doctrine, it's just a new way of looking at something. But John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That little phrase right there is the most complex yet simplest sermon ever preached. Daily they were sacrificing for sin and Jesus came to be that one time for all for everybody's sacrifice. And John's pointing him out. And what happened? A couple of John's disciples decide they're going to walk over and see what Jesus is all about. And so they walk up to him and they say, and Jesus looks at him and he says, what do you seek? What do you want? And they said, teacher, where are you staying? I read that and I thought, what? What kind of a question is that? You're looking at Jesus and you want to know where he's staying? But then I thought about it and I thought, how many times, you guys have done it, I've done it, how many times is there somebody that's big and important that we're looking up to and we want them to notice us? And so we walk up and say the first thing that pops out of our mouth and then we try to grab it and bring it back and it's too late. Just so they'll notice us. And I think that's what these guys are doing. I want to be noticed by Jesus. So they pop out, where are you staying? But Jesus doesn't condemn them, does he? He doesn't ridicule them. You know what he does? He says, come and see. Come and see. Can I interpret that for you? How bad do you want to know? I love it what Jesus does here because they said, where are you staying? He said, come and see. What he's doing is he's throwing out a challenge. you got a choice. You can come and see or you can walk away and miss it. And that's what he says to us. Whenever he speaks to us, you can come and see what I've got for you. You can come and see what I want to do with you and what I want to do to you and what I want to do for you and what I want to do through you or you can walk away, and you can miss it. And a little later, one of the guys went, and they got, got, to, got Simon Peter, and he brought him to Jesus. How simple is that? He just brought him to Jesus. And later on, a couple guys went, and they got, they got Nathaniel. And they said, Nathaniel, we found Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth? They hated the Nazarites. So what, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he said, come and see. Get this. Come and see. We are, there's no argument there. We are never going to argue somebody into the kingdom of God. It's just simply, here's what he did for me. Come and see for yourself. Come and try him on for yourself. Come and see. And so he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus said, look at here. An Israelite with no deceit. And he looks at him and says, wow. How do you know me? 
And Jesus said, before you came, I saw you when you were sitting underneath the fig tree. And Nathanael says, you are the son of God. And Jesus says, wait a minute, just because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you call me the son of God? That's all it takes for you to believe? Guess what? Hereafter, you're going to see the son of man. You're going to see heaven open, the angel of God descending and ascending upon the son of man. You know what he's saying right there, really? He's saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what Jesus is telling him. You ain't seen nothing yet. You think, you, you think it's big that I saw you in the three? You ain't seen nothing yet. Hang on. When, I, when, when God spoke to me about coming down here, I felt like God was saying, you watch me. Sit back and watch me blow your mind because you ain't seen nothing yet. And that's what I say to you guys. You ain't seen nothing yet. Grab a hold of Jesus and watch what he does and let him work through you and let him work in you and let him have his way with you 100% holding nothing back because if you do that, you ain't seen nothing yet. Can I close with a story, a true story that I took part in? His name was John Kevin Lamb. We called him Kevin. On the police radio, he was known as 038. I watched him grow up as a kid. I helped train him when he became a rookie with our department. I helped supervise him when he hit the streets. Kevin was a good cop. But our little town of North Pole, Alaska, was too small for Kevin. There weren't enough calls. There wasn't enough excitement. There wasn't enough action. So he made the move to the city to Fairbanks. There was more calls, more action, more excitement. But unfortunately for Kevin, it was a move that would prove fatal. It was New Year's Day, 1998, January 1. 8 o'clock in the evening, 35 degrees below zero. A deranged maniac kicked, her boyfriend, kicked, kicked his girlfriend out of their apartment. She did what most people do at a time like that. She called the cops. Kevin and two of his partners responded to, to the scene. They talked with her. She gave her their permission to enter the apartment. And as they entered the darkened apartment, Kevin went through the door first. And, and because of how it was laid out and the furniture and so forth, the couch was, for whatever reason, pulled away from the wall. Kevin stepped behind the couch. Charles and Matt came in next. And suddenly the darkness was pierced with gunfire. The girlfriend, for whatever reason, had either forgot or didn't tell him that he was drunk and holed up with guns. Matt took a bullet to the shoulder and a bullet to the side of the head and fell to the floor. Kevin is now trapped behind the couch and he begins to lay down cover fire so that, Matt, so that Charles can get Matt out. The gunman raced across the living room. He barricaded himself behind an upright support post in the hallway. He picked up a military rifle, pointed it at Kevin, and from point blank range pulled the trigger. Kevin took five bullets through his trauma plate, through his vest, and through his heart. He was dead before he hit the floor. We didn't know that at the time. All we knew was that he was down and he was not responding to radio calls. I was working on paperwork in my office when I heard my dispatcher scream. I went running into the, to the dispatch center in time to hear Charles say that Matt had been shot and Kevin was down and not responding. I told her I was going. She immediately wrote Scott 10-8 on her dispatch log. I grabbed my police dog, got her in the car, and I raced to 15 or 16 miles to Fairbanks. They told me later I made it in seven minutes flat. I don't know. I wasn't keeping track. I just knew that my brother officer was down and he needed my help. Only we were too late. That night is burned on my mind. I will never forget it. I still have flashbacks to this day. I remember turning the corner and, and seeing Kevin's patrol car parked, the lights off, the exhaust streaming through the cold night air. I remember the long moments while we, we did the perimeter and set up a perimeter around the house and, and waited for the SWAT teams. And they sent in two, one to get the bad guy and one to, do, to get Kevin. We didn't know what the bad guy had shot himself right after he shot Kevin. I remember the sound of the flashbangs going off and the shattering glass and the splintering wood as the troopers made their entry. I remember him bringing Kevin out. I remember helping, him, helping to load him on the gurney and put him in the ambulance for his last ride to the hospital. At the hospital, those hallways filled with silent cops staring off into space, hoping against all hope for a good outcome. The word from the lieutenant that Kevin was gone. With silent sobs and tear-filled eyes. The 21-gun salute, the sound of taps echoing through the cold night air, I'll never forget it. Law enforcement changed for me that night. It was no longer fun. It was serious business. It was deadly serious business. And, and I, although I, I had my own brush with death a few years later, but the difference was my wife put my purple heart on my chest. Kevin's purple heart was given to his widow. 
We all carried tape recorders and, and we turned them on whenever we went on a call and in, in the investigation into that shooting and, and all the aftermath, listening to Kevin's recorder and the recorders of the other officers and the radio traffic, it was found that Kevin had made a conscious decision. He knew that, Charles, or that Matt had been shot and he needed to get out. He knew he was trapped behind the couch and he couldn't get out and he chose to stand fast and lay down cover fire so that Charles could get Matt out. Matt and Charles are alive today. Kevin gave his life that day. Backtrack a couple thousand years. The world is dark by sin. The deranged maniac of the devil is running rampant until God called the cops. He sent Jesus. And Jesus entered that sin-darkened apartment and he barricaded himself behind that couch and he stood firm and he took the bullets that were meant for you and for me. And he died so we could get out. But the story doesn't end there, does it? Because three days later, Jesus walked out of that grave, alive and living today. He had to, otherwise he'd be nothing more than a dead martyr. Somebody maybe to be proud of, but nobody to change a life. That day back in, in 1998, Charles and Matt did not have to take advantage of the sacrifice that Kevin was making unless they wanted to live. And you and I don't have to take advantage of the sacrifice that Jesus made and is making unless, they, unless we want to live. He says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So my question is, what do we do with Jesus? If you know him, share him. Point him out to those around us. If you don't know him, now's the time. Get acquainted. Let him do what he wants to do with you because you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for being on a Christian campus that takes a day and shuts things down and devotes it to prayer and worship. It has been so neat today to walk around this campus and drive around this campus and see groups huddled all around just, just praying. That's, that's so cool, and we thank you. Thank you for this group today that came, and, and, and would you just take what was said today and, and just drive it into each heart and let each person here today be encouraged and drawn closer to you. For what you do and what you've done, we thank you. Amen.